Next item are proclamations, and we have none tonight. And the next item is our appointment, and this is the appointment of Gilbert von Studnitz of the Historic Preservation Regulations to track and reduce emissions from petroleum emissions from petroleum refineries and who do we have for a spokesperson tonight i will do the introductions if you if you um madam mayor um, and members of the council um as you may know the bay area air quality management district has been developing new regulations to track and reduce emissions from petroleum refineries staff has been tracking that process and found out that the uh district or district representative would be in benicia I believe it's March 22nd, but the person that's coming up will be able to confirm that date and time and location. And we thought that the council would be interested in a preview of that presentation to have an opportunity to ask questions directly of the air quality district. So, and the air quality district was kind enough to send Eric Stevenson, uh, the director of technical services, to make a presentation to the council. So um, he's here in the audience and coming up. Mr. Stevenson, welcome. It's good to see you again. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the Council. Um, I am Eric Stevenson. I'm the Director of Technical Services for the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, and I've been charged uh, specifically with developing um, two rules that deal with refineries, um, also known as Regulation 12, Rule 15, and Regulation 12, 16. And I'd like to give you a brief outline of what those regulations entail. In addition to additional work that the Air District is um, taking part in to reduce emissions at refineries in general. Let's see. Oops, there we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so one of the things that the Air District is attempting to do to reduce overall emissions at all of the five Bay Area refineries is to take a multi-pronged approach. Um, we've developed Two rules, uh, as I said, Regulation 1215, and if it's all right with you, I'll just call it 1215 from now on, and Regulation um, 1216, uh, to track refinery emissions and then to mitigate emissions if they go above thresholds. In addition to that, we're looking to develop new rules and amend existing rules to try and achieve um, an overall 20% reduction in five years of emissions at all Bay Area. Um, refineries. Um, 1215 has been developed and has been under development for quite some time, and the main uh, points of this rule have not changed considerably over that time period. And basically, um, we'll ask the refineries to do a number of measures that um, are quite cutting edge and are not done anywhere else in the United States. Um, we'll be asking them to compile annual emissions inventories for their facility overall. Right now, the district looks at uh, refineries on a source-by-source -source basis, and it's, um, it can be somewhat difficult to compile all those emissions and get an overall emission um, of the refinery itself. So part of that requirement will be that refineries perform these emissions and, and look at uh, the refinery as a whole. To develop a, uh, a petroleum emission refinery profile or a prep. Um, what this will do is outline those emissions on an annual basis and those will act as a baseline for refinery emissions over time. Part of that um, process will also require that the refineries provide the air district with uh, crude oil composition um, information, uh, basically nitrogen content, sulfur content, API gravity, um, and uh, total acid number, or TAN. It will also require that the refineries redo health risk assessments, or HRAs, that look at um, the overall emissions from the refinery and calculate risk to the folks that are living around the refinery. And we'll also establish um, fence line monitoring requirements around the refineries in addition to uh, community monitoring within the communities themselves. Um, what we heard when we brought this regulation out to the public was that they uh, appreciated the fact that we were requiring the refineries to do these things, but they also uh, provided feedback that um, they wanted to ensure that the change in crude oil um, composition didn't cause um, additional emissions at the refineries themselves. And so we developed Regulation 12, Rule 16. It has a number of goals. 
Um, basically, we want the refineries to give us information on uh, what we call criteria pollutants. Those pollutants, they're regulated by the federal government, include ozone, oxides of nitrogen, carbon monoxide, particulate matter 2.5 microns or less, things of that nature. Um, toxic air contaminants or tax, and also greenhouse Hello. gases or GHG. Um, what it will do is require that uh, any increase um, yes. causes a causal analysis by the refinery. Yeah. Um, any increase above uh, given thresholds uh, will require a causal analysis by the refinery yes. to try and identify ahead. what was the cause of that emission increase. Why are you it calling me? require you? mitigation plans to be submitted for um, criteria pollutants and tax. Oh, I'm not interested. I'm on. I do not call the this. The public have an opportunity to review. Um, the mitigation plans that are put forward and provides an opportunity for the public to comment on those plans. Um, what we're trying to do with these regulations is ensure that the change in crude oil, oil quality does not cause additional emissions um, at the refineries. And it will also help us identify the processes and equipment that may be causing additional emissions so that we can focus our regulatory actions on those specific parts of the refinery. So just to give you an idea of what this regulation requires, now that I've told you the goals, is it does require a causal analysis, as I've stated. Um, the mitigation plans will bring uh, emissions of toxic air contaminants and criteria pollutants below those threshold levels. Um, if the refineries cannot bring those thresholds below, I mean, bring those emissions below those thresholds, within a two-year time period, they will be required to do an audit of the entire refinery and inform the district of everything that's going on there, telling us what controls are in place, what, um, how those controls perform, um, what we call best available control technologies will be identified. If um, for some reason they are unable to achieve um, those reductions in a two-year period, they'll be required to submit additional plans outlining how they will bring those emissions underneath those thresholds. In addition to that, um, if within a given time period risk increases at the refinery, they'll be required to perform another health risk assessment. It's important to note that both these regulations are proposed at this time, so there's possibilities there will be changes to the regulatory language um, and also addition or subtractions of some of these items. I also stated that we're looking at other um, potential sources of emissions. I apologize for the size of this font. I don't expect you guys to be able to read it from back there. But basically it outlines um, some of the additional things that we are looking at as a district to uh, further focus on refinery emissions. They include things like um, a fluidized catalytic cracking unit regulation, um, additional regulations on tankage. Um, things of that nature to bring overall emissions down at the refineries over time. So the next steps that are involved here, we're going through our regulatory process. Um, we believe we'll be uh, releasing what we call our workshop report and the regulatory language on our website within the next week or so. We've already released um, the proposed regular regulatory language on our website and have asked for public comment. Um, we'll be holding four public workshops throughout the Bay Area. One of them will be in Venetia. It will be held on, I believe it's Monday the 16th of March. Um, of course, that's all tentative. Um, we have timelines that we have to meet, so if some of the timelines get pushed back, we may have to push some of those meetings back. But of course, that will all be noticed um, on our website and through various other methods. Um, We'll be presenting not only in Venetia, but in Martinez, Richmond, and also at the district office. The district office will have that, present, that presentation and workshop uh, webcast, so folks that maybe can't make it to San Francisco or one of the other meetings will be able to tune in on the web. Um, our goal is to be able to present these two regulations to our board of direction, directors for potential adoption in the second quarter of 2015. Um, I was tasked with uh, getting these rules to the board um, by spring, and I just want to remind everybody, spring is until June 20th. Um, we also have been tasked with expediting uh, 
additional rules and um, proposing amendments to rules that are already in place to uh, further reduce emissions at refineries. Our goal is to try and get uh, a large package of these uh, either new or uh, modified regulations to our board by the end of this year. Um, of course, we'll follow our own public protocol requirements during this process, um, asking for input from um, various communities, taking workshops out to the affected communities and listening and, and encouraging the public for uh, their input. At this point, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, yes, I think we have a question from Vice Mayor Hughes. Thank you. Eric, have the, um, have the Bay Area refineries been involved in this rulemaking process? In other words, did the district reach out to them and say, we're looking at developing these new rules, would you like to participate, or at a minimum, provide input? Um, yes, we've, we've encouraged all interested parties to partake in, in meetings with us to discuss the language of the, the regulations and the intent of the regulations so that we can develop the regulations that make sense um, from both uh, uh, refining standpoint and from uh, what the public's concerns might be. And what is their reaction then? Um, it's difficult to characterize. Um, they've, they've provided a lot of um, very specific and, and helpful input into the process. Um, they have, have been willing participants. Um, last question. Are some of the Bay Area refineries already complying with some of the elements of these rules? Um, yes. In particular, uh, two refineries have already installed fence line monitors around their, their facilities. Um, one refinery has also put out uh, community monitoring within the community around the facility. Okay. Thank you. Uh, before I call on Councilmember Campbell, I want to do a follow-up on the fence line monitoring. So, um, as, as I understand it, that Richmond has some uh, fence line monitors and that the Air District is proposing a different type. Has that issue been resolved? Um, basically, Madam Mayor, what we've done is we put together a guidance document that allows the refineries to propose um, Various methods uh, does not define a given method, but just uh, outlines basically the performance parameters that the fence line monitoring must meet. So the refineries are are able to procure various uh, pieces of equipment from various manufacturers. So they're they're. It's equipment that meets the requirements of the air district, and it can be a variety of equipment. And then how is that calibrated over time? Um, what we'll be requiring of the refineries is to put together what's known as a quality assurance project plan that outlines all the performance parameters that they will be um, putting in place to ensure that the data quality uh, meets the requirements of, of the guidance. So there's a whole process that will be put in place to ensure that things such as calibration, um, you know, maintenance, uh, and, and other quality assurance um, parameters are, are met up front. And at one of the refineries, as I understand, there's real-time monitoring that is provided to the public. Is that going to be made available for all the refineries as they put in their monitors? Yes, ma'am. Um, part of the guidance does require that the public have real-time access to the data. Will, we, will there be guidance from the district about what the public is looking at? So if there's a spike or if there is a constant high number, what does that mean? Um, that's an excellent question. Probably one of the most difficult uh, things to do well. It's going to be a lot of information. There's going to have to be context provided. Within the guidance, we um, try and offer suggestions on that so that the refineries are able to provide that information to the public and, and provide some context on what that information means. And let's say that these rules are approved in a timely manner and next year, as I understand. They no, go it would Theoretically, it would be June 20th of this okay. year. And there would be no litigation or anything. How long would the district uh, allow for the monitors to be in place? Um, the rule outlines the time frames in which uh, uh, all of the, the various monitors would have to be in place. Um, I believe, uh, as the rules stand now, um, they would have a year from um, January 1st, 2016, 
to have the plans submitted and approved and operating systems um, in place after that. Okay, um, Council Member Campbell. So, sort of along that line, uh, what happened to our fence line monitoring system that we were going to put in Benicia maybe like 10 years ago? I mean, you know, I've lost, it's been so long I've sort of lost track. You know? So, um, Mr. Kilger? Yes, um, there has been extensive discussions between Valero, the city, and the Good Neighbor Steering Committee to uh, look at opportunities for the uh, air monitoring station, which was part of the Good Neighbor Steering Committee agreement, as you're referencing. Um, interestingly, uh, based upon those discussions, while all three parties worked to try to find a resolution on how to make it operational, it was really not clear in the agreement who owned it once it was um, put, to, uh, put in place. And many of the questions the mayor was asking of the gentleman tonight were questions that were asked by the group and how we would best manage that and whether or not the equipment in itself could accomplish all of that and where would you put it and what time and that sort of thing. Um, at the final stage, uh, Valero had a certain amount of responsibility from a financial standpoint to uh, put the trailer together and equip it and uh, indicated they had met, uh, met that. Um, the city indicated early on, while we were fully supportive, we were not capable of uh, providing the staffing uh, to uh, manage it or, as I like the gentleman said, put it into the proper context for the community. That's, that means a lot. And then, uh, uh, and, uh, but yet, Good Neighbor Steering Committee, uh, at least until I believe recently, but uh, at this stage, um, have always been fully um, uh, uh, supportive of that. We have met recently and we are continuing to look at ways that we might be able to utilize that as an educational tool for the community and there have been discussions with the local colleges. Now, there may be updates to that, but that's the latest that I have on it. Okay, well, I, I, that got me a little bit distracted, but the question actually really wanted to ask you about, it looks like you're heading toward doing a crude oil composition characteristics and I guess the reason behind it is to you know, uh, uh, any changes uh, so as not to increase admit the emissions. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out exactly what you, what the air quality district is up to on that one because, I mean, sort of doesn't matter what gets put in a refinery because what comes out is the important part, the CO2 and what have you, and you guys are already monitoring that. So I was just curious, what is the rationale? Well, as, as you may be aware, there's... Um, different types of crude oil that are now coming into Bay Area refineries, some from um, the Bocking Formation in, in uh, the Dakotas, um, some from uh, Canada, Canada um, the tar sands in Alberta. And there's um, some concern um, that the, uh, um, I apologize, I can't help but get kind of wonky, so um, please stop me or ask me any questions about terms that I might use that that are in common usage, but because these tar sands and Bakken uh, crudes tend to, have, you know, be either more sour or um, less sweet than a lot of the crudes that um, may be coming in uh, and traditionally processed at the refineries, there's concern that they will cause, uh, just by their very nature and the amount of treatment um, that would be required to bring those uh, to marketable um, products. Uh, are going to increase the emissions at the refinery. Um, and, and so we're, we're taking a look at this crude composition to see if that is indeed the case. Okay, because it looks like, you know, your call is to monitor what's coming out of the refinery. Mm -hmm. that's, that's accurate, sir, but um, what, one of the things um, that, that the Air District has traditionally done is just that, just looking at what's coming out of the refinery, not necessarily what's what's going in. And the reason for including um, the crude oil composition is um, just to try and determine if indeed uh, that has an effect um, that that uh, translates to emissions. Okay. I have a series of questions, but I want to start with the one that concerns me the most, which are uh, probably what you consider the three biggest challenges for getting the rule in place. Oh, okay. Um, what do I consider the three biggest challenges? Um, at, at, 
this point, um, I think it's it's uh, difficult to tell. We've put out the, the draft language um, to the community and to industry. We haven't received yet um, many comments on uh, whether they approve of particular sections or disapprove of particular sections. So it's difficult for me to answer um, what I think might be the most um, controversial topics with these particular rules. Um, there, there, are, there is a lot of discomfort from um, industry on requesting a lot of this information. Um, I know that there's also um, some discomfort with uh, us, the, the Air District, um, potentially um, uh, limiting the amount of, of oil that may be processed through any given refinery. So we're trying to work the language to ensure that the district, that the refineries have the flexibility to increase um, throughput if, if needed. For example, if a refinery um, in Southern California goes down or something like that, so that the refineries have that flexibility to increase um, productivity within their regulatorily set uh, throughput caps. I think that's probably the largest uh, and, and most difficult thing to get through in this particular set of regulations. Okay, one of the concerns I have is about getting the air monitors in. As Mr. Kilger pointed out, we have a long history with wanting to have fence line monitoring. Mm -hmm. um, as I understand, the Air District for years and years believed that the ingredients that went to the soup of the sky that created the air pollution issues that you didn't need to measure um, in prox proximity to the emitter. And over time, you've changed your thoughts on that. And so now we're getting the air monitors in place because there may be a concentration of some kind of pollution criteria, pollution or attack that affects a sensitive population. So I think I understand that and I applaud you for that. That's really good. But I saw an exchange of letters from Mr. Lindsay in the city of Richmond with Chevron over that Chevron was dragging its heels on, I think that's his terminology, on putting in the legal settlement required air monitors. So what does the board do that um, with its authority to make sure that the fence line monitoring is in place and is set up and working? Excellent question. Um, the, the monitoring um, systems that went in place in Richmond were part of an agreement between the city of Richmond and, and Chevron. Um, ours would differ in that there are regulatory requirements that these systems be put in place. So we have um, notices of violation that can be issued to refineries if they fail to take appropriate action. So there's, there's you know, basically uh, fines and, and legal action that the Air District can take if the refineries don't meet the regulatory requirements. Well, if there was a continued delay on putting in the monitors and you do collect uh, fines on a regular basis, would you have a dedicated fund that those fines would be where you could actually put the uh, monitors in? Um, that that question's a little bit above my, my pay grade, I'm afraid. Um, Usually the, the fine structure is, is set in a way that the fines are returned to the district general fund. Um, I'm not, uh, uh, that is not my specialty, so I can't answer specifically for you. I apologize. That's okay. No apology. Um, so here's the simple one. Define a cargo carrier. Um, a, a cargo carrier uh, in the context of the rule is um, uh, shipping vessels, uh, large vessels and um, trains. Um, so we're including those in the overall emissions of the refinery itself. Um, those loading and unloading emissions that occur for both boats and trains um, would be included in the overall emissions inventory that, that the refineries would be required to put together. Uh, when you talk about the criteria pollutants and the tax, um, there are some things that are neither criteria pollutants or tax, and what do you say about those, and what's the future like for some of those things? Um, well, for criteria pollutants, um, they're pretty static. Uh, it's 
those are regulated by the federal government. So there's not a lot of change in those over time. Um, for tax, uh, there is a, a number of state agencies that continually review the scientific data that are available to them to um, change the uh, levels in which those tax um, are considered to, have, to do harm on populations. And also, um, they, there are mechanisms in place to ensure that if compounds are found to have toxic properties, they're included in lists and would be updated as part of the group. Okay. I have two more questions. One is, on these uh, new fence line monitors, will they be picking up coke dust, and will you be noting that? Um, the, the fence line monitors, um, at this point, uh, are not... As, as far as I know, I'm not a fence line monitoring uh, manufacturer, but as far as I know, uh, many do not have the ability to identify particulate matter, um, which would be uh, the way we would identify coked dust. Um, we are requiring that the monitors placed within the community themselves would monitor for PM25, which would include coke dust. Okay, great. And then the question I keep asking, and I never seem to get an answer, uh, not from you, but just from others, is how does AB32 work in terms of the refineries? We, I never see a plan. I never see exactly how that's working and what does that mean. And we as a city, 82% of our greenhouse gases come from our industrial area. And so we can be the best people in the world, which we are, of course, and reduce our greenhouse gases but we still have this uh, major uh, contributor to greenhouse gases that's regulated by the state, and the city doesn't have any regulatory authority over that. So how does that work? Well, I'm, again, um, as you pointed out, that's a, a, a California Air Resources Board program. Um, so it, it is quite complicated, and I am not an expert in its mechanisms or its workings by any stretch of the imagination. However, um, GHG will be required to uh, be part of the emissions inventory for each refinery. So you'll be able to take a look at what is being emitted as far as GHGs go from each refinery. Okay, if you have any opportunity to send us kind of a step-by-step -step process that would help us, it would be really great. Okay. By step-by-step? -step. Well, in other words, the compliance issue. If there's something from the Air Board or what have you that is off the shelf and you don't have to create it, that would really be helpful. So uh, let me see if there are any other questions from the council. Um, I'll ask if there's anyone from the public that has a question. I don't see anybody jumping up. So thank you very much for coming out. And it was very informative. And keep up the good work. Thank you. And again, we'll be back out in Venetia in about a month. And um, look forward to answering some of the questions I wasn't able to answer for you this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Nice job.